Good to be here. I moved to Bristol from Devon last September. I'm particularly excited to be here as part of Bristol Big Green Week um, and promoting the concept of smart living. So I've uh, had a lifelong passion for the environment and averting climate change. Uh, my mother and father run an environmental magazine. And so when I left uh, education, I started looking into you know, how I can live and what m might now be called a smart lifestyle. I, in those days, used to call it a low carbon lifestyle. And um, trying out all sorts of experiments like um, how many days of the week could I go without getting into my car and um, eating muddy vegetables and purchasing quality, long-lasting products. And um, it took me a few years to see the pattern, but um, what I started to see is that every single decision that I made to cut my carbon footprint was improving my quality of life and making me happier and healthier. And when I started to see this pattern, I started to take bigger and bigger, bolder steps, and I went to Sicily by train, um, which was a phenomenal experience. And I worked out that actually I'd lost less daytime hours than I would have been flying. Uh, a lot of the travel was done at night. And so um, it's been a, a sort of lifelong um, story for me. It's coming to the conclusion um, that, as the Dalai Lama says, be wisely selfish. If we make decisions that are really, really good for us as individuals, we put ourselves first, um, and we make decisions and choices that make us happier and healthier today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, in 10 years, with our children, with our grandchildren, those decisions will automatically be good for the community, and they'll automatically be good for the environment as well. And so this is all wrapped up in this theme of smart living. Um, and I think it's a brilliant way of representing um, the question of um, lifestyle choices to ourselves. And so um, as part of smart living, of course, we have smart homes. Um, part of my background, um, how I got into this field, um, I was also very interested in low carbon transport. And I designed and built a zero emission micro yacht um, which there's a picture of here, and I sailed around Britain in 2007 uh, to promote low-carbon lifestyles. And as a result of that, um, during the tour, um, oh, this, this is a feature of the boat, so it was an, an innovative boat because it was designed and conceptualized to have no engine, which meant that it had to be light enough to row and seaworthy enough to go offshore in the British coast, which is a very difficult combination. Um, so, um, I developed this, I uh, invented this special keel design, um, which you see here, it's called the swing bulb keel, and effectively it's like a parallelogram, it's got the keel split in half front and back with two pins at the top, two pins at the bottom, and when you pull it up using that cord, the lead weight stays horizontal at all times, and this meant that you could have a very deep draft keel when you're at sea, but when you go into a river or a harbour, you could pull it up. And so um, a yacht designer said to me, it will probably work, but I think you'll find it won't be worth all the engineering trouble that you'll go through. Um, but once I'd actually built it and sailed around Britain, he was really impressed. And when you take a new design principle, like the lowest possible embodied carbon and the lowest carbon in use, and you start taking steps down that road, you start finding unexpected benefits that you never could have foreseen without going down that road. And I think this is the incredibly exciting thing about the next few decades. We're going to see this in every sector of the economy. Here, with a group of friends, um, we walked from where I had the boat at St. Catherine's Docks in London. We walked to the Houses of Parliament and delivered a copy of my little booklet, The Guide to Low Carbon Lifestyles, to every MP and Lord in the Houses of Parliament. Um, and as a result of that, after I finished the tour, um, I got invited to Parliament to do an internship for a couple of weeks. And I heard MPs asking, how are we going to insulate Britain's old housing stock? Because that will cut the national carbon footprint by 10% and is therefore an essential component 
in achieving the government's carbon reduction targets. So um, I was having dinner um, with an environmental entrepreneur, uh, Paul Dickinson, who runs the Carbon Disclosure Project. I said, I'm thinking of starting an insulation company. And he said, I'd be happy to help you with that tomorrow. Because my friend, Gary Felgate, who at the time was the CEO of the Energy Retail Association, had said to Paul that insulation has got such a high return on investment that it's virtually like printing money. And so um, we started Cozy Home Company in 2010. And we thought, you know, if we developed a company and grew it to a size of 50, 50 million turnover um, with hundreds of staff, and we worked solidly for 20 years, we would not insulate 1% of Britain's homes. So we're going to have to inspire and catalyze a retrofitting revolution in Britain. And so how are we going to do that? And I said, well, if we start at the most difficult end of the spectrum with Britain's beautiful heritage listed and most hard to treat properties and prove that we can solve every single insulation pro problem in those properties, um, then we'll have all the solutions and then other companies can copy us and fill in the middle ground. And there may be a chance to get Britain insulated in the next 15 years or so. Um, so that's what Cozy Home Company was set up to do provide insulation solutions for period properties, more accurately to say, for properties over 100 years old. It could be a, a, an elegant manor home, but it could be a small Victorian terrace home, and they have similar range of issues. So how do we retrofit an old property, and what are the benefits, and what is um, the kind of national scale of this, um, this challenge? Um, there's 27 million homes in Britain, um, about 3 million are well insulated, and so that leaves 24 million in need of reducing their heat loss by around 80%. Um, new build homes today are at least five times more efficient than the old homes, and so we're lucky to have really good building regs, and homes built today are really efficient. So 27 million homes, and out of those, about a million are listed and in conservation areas, and they can't fit double glazing, generally. Um, so we need to look at solutions where we preserve the old windows. What is the spread of heat loss in an old property? Well, approximately 10% is going out through the loft, 20% is going out through the glass, 30% is going out through drafts, 25% is going out through the walls, and about 15% of the heat is going out through the floors. So to look at it in really simple terms, if you top up your loft insulation from 100 millimetres to 300 millimetres, that will cut the heat loss through the loft by 70%. If you um, do adequate draft proofing, and in an old property, old properties do need to breathe, so we can't seal them up completely um, at this stage. There's some new inventions which are coming along um, which may allow us to seal up old properties and ventilate them otherwise. Um, but for the moment, if you own an old property, um, I would advise not to seal it up completely. Just um, put draft proofing on the doors and windows where the curtains are actually billowing in the wind and reduce the drafts by 70%. With the glass, um, double glazing if you need to replace your windows um, and just ensure that um, the specification is that they have a really good U value, which is 1.6 or below. Um, you can get um, conservation units now, um, which are only 10 millimetres thick overall. They've got 3 millimetres of glass, 4 millimetres of gas, and another 3 millimetres of glass and they will go into fairly old windows and look fairly nice. The problem is that they have so, such a small sight line in the glazing bar around the edge that there's not much glue holding them together. So quite often they only have a five-year guarantee. So that's the issue that you have to check out if you're buying these conservation double glazing units. And then there's a traditional form of secondary glazing, um, which is glass and in a big aluminium frame slides across the window, um, and that will cut the heat loss from an old window by about half, um, 
from a U-value. Single glazed window has a U-value of around 5.5, and um, a double glazed window has a U-value around 1.6. Um, the old-fashioned secondary glazing has a U-value of around 2.5. So it's, it's pretty good. It's a big step forward. At Cozy Home Company, we've developed an advanced secondary glazing system that I'll show you some photos of in a moment. And that's got a calculated U-value of 1.7, so it's nearly as good as double glazing. Um, so that's the glass. Walls are tricky. Um, External wall insulation is currently thought to be the best thing to do. Um, and that's in very simple terms. You add insulative boards on the outside of your house. You cover it in a steel mesh, which is fixed through with fixings into the walls. And then you render it. And you can do this with a breathable eco material like diffutherm wood fiber board as the insulation and then lime render. And so it can breathe. Um, but um, it does need to be done well, and of course, if you have stone or brick face and you don't want to lose the look of your building, um, then that's not an option. But if you've got a render-finished render building, it could work really well. And there's all kinds of systems um, to make it very simple um, to put the insulation underneath the gutter with a little um, kind of lip over the top of it that mean you don't have to extend all the slates of your roof and things like this and they've got systems um, to provide strong fixings for gutter down pipes, soil pipes, etc. So the art of external wall insulation is really getting going and there's some really good systems out there. And for the most part, my understanding of the state of the art is it's relatively problem free if it's done well um, to start with. If you can't do the outside of your walls, then you're looking at internal wall insulation. And this is a tricky area, and the reason is that you can get condensation trapped between the insulation and the wall. Um, essentially, at the moment, <clears throat> that solid wall is being warmed up by the air in the room. So the moist air that we all breathe out is not going to form condensation on that wall because the inside surface is fairly warm. If I go and put insulation all over that, then in the winter, that whole wall will drop to external temperatures, maybe zero. If any moist air creeps in through any cracks around the beams or anywhere else, touches that cold face, it will turn into condensation. It's then trapped in behind the insulation. It can't get out. And over decades, that causes mold and rot and all sorts of problems. So internal wall insulation if you're considering it, um, I would recommend strongly to get an architect's specification. And they will be able to specify that you need certain breathable membranes. You may, um, you may need to have a ventilated space behind, etc. So that's internal wall insulation is the only really complicated um, area of insulating old properties. And finally, the floors, the final surface um, of, the of the home. So if you are planning to replace your floorboards for any reason that you want to have wooden floorboards put in, if you've got a solid floor or your floorboards need um, to come up and be put back down, then that is the opportunity to insulate underneath the floors. If you've got a solid floor, it does mean excavating, digging out at least four inches or six inches underneath, putting down um, a membrane, waterproof membrane, putting in a levelling material and then putting ideally four inches, minimum of two, insulation, two inches of insulation underneath your floors. Um, if you've got a hung floor, you take up the floorboards, you put little tiny little beads along the bottom edges of the floor joists, drop in some panels like plywood, which could have holes in to make it breathable, drop in the insulation and put the um, floorboards back down on top. because. What we're looking at in insulating old properties is you're looking at the heated space. And the idea is to put an insulative envelope around the heated space. And so that's right up against the, 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 the surfaces of the heated space. So um, that's the five surfaces. And how does insulation work so that we actually understand the principles? Essentially. You've got two large categories of materials 
We've got solid materials, um, and which are very heavy and dense, and that includes concrete, slate, brick, uh, metal, even very hard woods. Um, in those materials, the atoms are packed very tightly together. And so when you apply heat at one side, like if you imagine a cast iron frying pan, you apply heat and the atoms packed tightly together all vibrate, pass on the vibration of the heat from one to the other. The heat comes up the cast iron pa pan handle and burns your hand. All insulators are very lightweight materials. It might be clothes, um, duvets, um, balsa wood, polystyrene, anything very light in which the atoms have got a lot of space between them and that's what makes them light. Um, in those materials you vibrate the atoms at one end and they can't pass the vibration to the next atom very easily so they cannot transmit heat very well. So you have your oven glove which is a very lightweight material and you don't get burnt. Um, when you pick up the cast iron frying pan. So it's the same with our homes. What we're trying to do is wrap the home in a great big duvet. That's the simple principle of insulation. A big duvet around the whole house, combined with double glazing, because you don't want a duvet over your windows. Um, but in fact, double glazing is putting a duvet um, between two sheets of glass. Um, because duvet is just trapped air, if you vacuum pack a duvet, it won't keep you warm at all. Um, the feathers don't keep you warm. The feathers hold the air still, and the air keeps you warm. So that um, layer of air between the double glazing is the duvet effect. And um, the optimum spacing for double or secondary glazing is 18 millimeters, because if you get a bigger space, the air starts to circulate in the void and um, it can transfer heat more readily, which is why if they want to have a better effect than double glazing, you have triple glazing with two narrow air gaps. So you get more, more duvet effect without allowing the circulation. So that's the, the basic principles of retrofitting and how that's going to work in an old property. Um, so I'd like to just show you a few examples of um, the kinds of properties that can be treated now um, with advanced um, secondary glazing or other types of secondary glazing and some of the solutions that we've developed at Cozy Home Company. And again, like the boat design where the low carbon principle led me to invent a, a different keel design which turned out to have all kinds of extra benefits. Um, when I started trying to insulate old properties, I started with my mother and father's old 17th century farmhouse. And I started with putting in kind of second windows timber windows with glass that opened into the, um, the rebate in, in, or the, the alcove that the, the window's in, and, and this would open up and then you could get to your sash window. Um, but I then started looking at what is the solution that has the very lowest embodied carbon, the lowest embodied energy that uses the least amount of material to achieve the final purpose of insulating. And I started looking into using materials like plexiglass, um, which plexiglass can't break, it, well, it doesn't break, it's used for airplane windows, it doesn't break easily, doesn't shatter, it's not going to cut you, so it doesn't need a big heavy aluminium frame to hold it up. So therefore, it's also very lightweight, so therefore, you can use the absolute minimum of extra material added to an existing window um, and we found a solution which actually uses magnetic tapes to attach it to the window so that you can easily remove it for cleaning. And it turned out to have lots of advantages. Plexiglass is a much better insulator than glass, um, so the end result has better thermal efficiency um, and because it goes on to the opening casement or the sliding sashes, you can open your windows as usual. So here's a few slides for you. Um, this is just an example of an old property um, with stone mullions on the windows and leaded lights. And we found a way to um, put secondary glazing on that that was so inconspicuous that they said that none of their friends noticed that anything had been done unless they pointed it out. And that's um, a, a Georgian terrace um, in Devon, which is where I'm from. Um, and it's got sliding sash windows, which we were able to treat. Um, this is a shot of thermofleece 
sheep wool loft insulation that we also use at Cozy Home Company. Um, it's 12% more efficient than mineral wool, um, but the most important thing is that it's incredibly resilient and durable. And so if the electrician goes up and moves it all and puts it back again, or if you put a suitcase on it or walk on it, it'll return to its original form. And it will keep doing that for probably more than 60 years. It's got a recommended life of 60 years. And I've surveyed a lot of lofts which have had the loft insulation topped up in the last few years um, with up to 300 millimeters of mineral wool. And by the time I get to survey it, half of it has been damaged because you squash mineral wool once and it will never return to its original shape. And so um, this has a lot of advantages, including supporting British farmers. And this is a wooden sliding sash window, and that actually has the secondary glazing, cosy glazing system on it. It's almost impossible to see because it's got a tiny wooden picture frame in front of it. Um, but the window opens as usual. Um, that is working on a, a curved um, sash window. And so we found that using very thin plexiglass that can curve, we can actually put secondary glazing onto windows that are actually curved. Um, here's a little something on restoration, um, just to show you what can be done in terms of restoring old windows with um, old timbers and epoxy resin, which comes from the marine industry, for nominally good adhesive. Um, and although it's not eco-friendly in its own right, I've made the decision until it gets reviewed again that it's ultimately more eco-friendly than throwing away all the glass and timber of an existing window. So that's a sill that's in bad condition. Um, that's some reclaimed pitch pine, um, which is a good match for the quality of the old timbers because the windows that we look at, those old Victorian and Georgian windows, often 100 or 150 years old, the reason they've lasted so long is partly because people put a lot of paint on, and that is very important, um, a lot of paint, um, but partly because the timber is really, really good quality. <coughs> and there it is, um, new, new curved sill. Um, so, it's interesting to think that Britain has around 270 million windows. And if we were to replace them every 25 years, which is you know, more than the guarantee on most UBVC windows, it means we would be putting 10 million windows a year into landfill. And then making enough glass to make another 10 million windows and enough aluminium or timber so the environmental impact just for the, the embodied materials is really big. And when we're looking at our beautiful old windows and thinking, hmm, they're a bit decayed, you know, should I throw them away? It's worth considering there's a lot of value sitting in front of you. Financially, you're looking at, you know, a thousand pounds, two thousand pounds worth of window, and you're looking at a lot of really good timber and glass. Um, so. I think it's important to think very carefully before replacing. Um, that's finishing the restoration. That's cutting plexiglass, so there's a lot of craftsmanship involved in retrofitting, and that's great for the economy, it creates a lot of labor. Um, so retrofitting involves a lot more craftsmanship and a lot less material. And um, that's refitting the magnetic tapes. And that's fitting the plexiglass. And the final result is a sliding sash window that opens as usual, but it's had its um, heat loss reduced by 70%. Some of the detail, you can see the plexiglass there in front of the sash, opening casement. And that's how you lift off, in that case it's a window that doesn't open, you lift off the plexiglass using a glass lift. And that's it, thank you very much.